Welcome to TalkNorth.com. Thanks to our longtime producer, Brandon Morton. Please download before you listen. If you'd like to advertise with us, you can reach us at TalkNorthPodcast at gmail.com. And please follow us on Twitter at TalkNorthPod. Uh, two promo codes to be aware of. BiteSquad.com. Use the promo code TalkNorth to get your first delivery free. And go to SodaStick.com, the great local apparel company. Use the promo code YouBetcha to get free shipping on any sized order. Thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on the show, Steve. It should be a good one. Thanks for having me, Steven. Double X, anytime, man. Christopher Mandog Russo here. You are listening to Steven Strom on TalkNorth.com. Always passionate, always fiery. You're listening to the Strom Sports Show. Take it away, Steven. Happy Sunday, everybody, and welcome into another edition here of the Strom Sports Show, episode 64. Steven Strom here, talknorth.com. Big shout out to my producer, Brandon Morton, Matt Augusta. And if you want to advertise with us, go on our website, talknorth.com, and contact Jim Suhan. We've got a lot to get into today. Will the NFL continue to let talented players Walk all over the integrity of this league. I will give you my three things that we learned from Sunday's Viking-Falcon game. Obviously a great start to the season for the Vikings. Even bigger game today. And to preview that, we have Mike Spofford from Packers.com. We'll take a look at the matchups that we should be looking at. How the Packers will try and attack the Vikings defense and vice versa. So we'll get some good insight from Mike in just a little bit here. Nothing or something also with producer Matt Augusta, and then we have to do my picks that were not very, I mean, listen, you're going to have weeks like this, and unfortunately it wasn't a great start, one and two with my picks last week, I'll give you my next three locks, and I'm going to say locks, I'm very confident I have the numbers to back it up, we will have my best three picks for week two with Mike Hickman, he will come on in the later hours of the show. So, My first thing that I said here was, does character really mean anything in the NFL anymore? Does the NFL care about the integrity of this league? If I'm an employee of any company in the entire universe, and I acted the way Antonio Brown has the past six months, the company would have a restraining order on me. But other than the world realizing Antonio Brown is off the walls, I learned something bigger. And that is that the NFL has turned into an empire filled with hypocrites. What kind of message are you sending younger athletes around the world with repeatedly giving Antonio Brown a pass? He wants out of Pittsburgh, fine. I don't agree when you sign a contract. I think you should honor it, but I can live with it. Then he goes on social media. He blasts Juju Smith-Schuster on an Instagram post and shows their DMs. Then he has an accident with his feet. He doesn't take proper care of his feet in the therapy chamber. Then he has issues with his helmet. And then he fights with Raiders GM Mike Mayock. Then he requests to be released. Now there's reports on a sexual assault charge. And the response to all of this from the NFL. And I understand you can't take action until he's proven guilty or innocent from the sexual assault charge. But everything else before that... NFL, a few fines don't mean a damn thing to this guy. Rich people are stubborn. But this goes beyond that. Is the NFL going to send a message to AB? Or continue to be embarrassed by this man? And we give him a pass because he can run fast and catch a football. That's why. If this guy's a fourth round pick, he's gone from the team, from maybe the league. And in an interview with ESPN he did... Right after the Steelers debacle, he claimed that he didn't need football. And you know what, Antonio Brown? Football doesn't need you. The fans don't need you. (laughs) The Raiders don't need you as they just beat Denver Monday night. And the Patriots sure as hell don't need you after beating Pittsburgh by 30. So NFL, what are you waiting for? 8B has been a detriment to the NFL these last six months. He's done things to stain the league's image and make it look pretty ugly at times. The NFL has its future with great young talented men like Patrick Mahomes and Saquon Barkley who speak well, who don't have any off the field issues. AB is taunting the NFL and the more they tolerate it, the more we're going to begin to see more and more of this AB behavior down the road. It's called learned behavior for a reason and the new generation sees this 
And they're going to think, if I have talent, if I can catch a football and I can jump high, uh, I'll get away with it. So I ask again, does the NFL care about character anymore? I'll answer that for you. No. It's all about talent. Character's overrated now. If you have enough talent, you, you get unlimited mulligans. You can do whatever you want. Even though if you were a fourth round pick and did 1% of what Antonio Brown did, he'd be cut. I don't want to spend a lot of time on him, so let's switch to this. As we always do after every Viking game, one of my favorite segments, the three things we learned from Sunday's outstanding, fun, energetic, lively Vikings game, Vikings win, I should say. Number one here, thing that we learned, Dalvin Cook and Alexander Mattinson, they can be the best duo of running backs in the NFL. You can give me Alvin Kamara and Latavius Murray. You can give me James White and Sony Michelle. You can give me Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. I love what I saw from Dalvin Cook and Alexander Mattinson. Both combined here, 172 yards, two touchdowns. If you can get that two-headed monster going, and this zone blocking scheme is for real, we'll see how it does today against Green Bay. It's a huge test. But if they can get two of these guys going, and you can get Cook the ball 20 times a game, and you can give Mattinson 10 touches a game, and they can combine for close to 180 yards, 200 yards, that would be superb. I don't expect that. I think 150 would be a great stat line from these two. You look at what Alexander Mattinson did, nine rushes, 51 yards. Dalvin Cook runs for 111 and two touchdowns. They have an opportunity in this league to be the best duo of running backs, and it's going to help Kirk Cousins' play-action game tremendously. I loved what I saw from the two running backs. That's number one thing I learned. Number two, the offsides. If there was one negative to this game, It's the offsides. The Vikings had three offside penalties, something that cannot happen today versus the Packers. We understand Aaron Rodgers is an unbelievable quarterback, top three in this league, and he is one of the best at drawing defenders offsides and capitalizing. There's a difference between just drawing these guys offsides and capitalizing on those free plays. No one does it better than Aaron Rodgers. Also, the timing of these penalties were crucial, both of them. Two out of the three, I'm sorry, were on third downs. You have to get off the field. You're lucky that you were playing Atlanta and you jumped all over them early. You do this in Green Bay at Lambeau Field, you're going you're gonna to fall into some trouble here. So enough with the offsides. It's got to change going into this game today against Green Bay. Number three, something maybe people didn't look at, the punter, because that's special teams. When special teams does great, no one talks about it. But when it does bad, it's a subject for the week. The punter that they just picked up, Britton Colquick, he looks solid. For the second straight season, the Vikes opened up with a punter that they just signed less than two weeks before the season opener. I thought he looked pretty good. Five times he punted, 49 and a half yards average. Two of his punts landed inside the uh, 20-yard line. And he also held Dan Bailey's kicks, who Dan Bailey was complaining about in preseason. He complained about it last year. And Dan Bailey went four for four. So maybe the Vikings have found their punter in Britain, Colquick. I know we could have went above and beyond over this game. I could have told you how much I love the defense and Anthony Harris. Congratulations, by the way, to him. But these are the three things that really stuck out to me. The offsides needs to change going into this game. Very excited for today. It's a border battle. It's just got a little more life and juice to it. And this is the first time here where we can get a real feel for how Kirk Cousins and this newly vamped offensive line is going to do against a pretty damn good Green Bay Packer defense that shut down the Bears and Mitchell Trubisky. That's going to be the huge test here. So when we come back here, we'll have Mike Spofford. He'll tell us and break down the border battle. What are we going to look out for in this matchup today? And all that good stuff coming up next here on the Strom Sports Show. And we're joined here by senior writer for Packers.com since 2006, Mike Spofford. He'll help break down the border battle. Mike, Steven Strom here from TalkNorth.com. Thank you for giving me some time today. How's everything? Pretty good. How are you doing, Steven? I'm good. It's border battle week. Very exciting. Two teams that I think have a big expectations. Um, let's start with the Packers. A huge win uh, in Chicago last Thursday. Aaron Rodgers gave Michelle DeFoya that classic grin when he was asked, what the difference was between this year's teams and others, and he said, we've got a defense. So give us some background on what makes this year's defense different. And also, I read your article, tremendous job on the third downs and confusing Mitchell Trubisky. I want you to talk a little bit about that as well. 
Yeah, well, the first thing the Packers did defensively in the offseason is uh, they changed a bunch of personnel. I mean, two key positions essentially got complete makeovers, and I'm talking about outside linebacker and safety because the Packers decided to move on from Clay Matthews and Nick Perry, who had been their bookend outside linebackers for quite some time. They signed Zadarius Smith and Preston Smith in free agency, and then they also uh, added – Rashawn Gary as their first of two first-round draft picks with the 12th overall selection. So those three joined Kyler Fackrell, who's coming back off of the first double-digit sack season of his career in 2018. So that's the quartet at uh, outside linebacker for the Packers, and three of those four players are brand new to Green Bay. Then you look at the safety position. The Packers decided to move on from Kentrell Bryce and HaHa Clinton Dix, who was traded last season, they uh, drafted Darnell Savage in the first round with that second first round pick. Uh, they traded, actually traded up in uh, the first round to be able to grab him from Maryland. And then another free agent acquisition, Adrian Amos, signing him from division rival Chicago. Mm. Another player just like the two Smiths, that outside linebacker who was from the 2015 draft class and was hitting free agency. So you're talking about defensively Mike Pettin being in his second year as the coordinator, some of the key returning players like Blake Martinez and Jair Alexander and players like that who got familiar with Pettin's system in the first year, they're all now in their second year in the system, and then you added an influx of new personnel um, with those players that I mentioned. So. Now you get into game one against Chicago, as you were talking about with the with the third downs, and quite frankly, they just uh, they never gave Mitch Trubisky the same look on third down twice. I think the Bears ended up three out of fifteen on their third down conversions, and it wasn't a matter of bringing a lot of blitzes in terms of extra rushers trying to send like five or six guys at him all the time. Right, right. It was it was bringing, you know, six, seven guys up to the line of scrimmage and then saying, okay, you know, maybe three of these guys are going to rush. Maybe four of them are going to rush. You know, maybe three of them are going to rush and another guy, a fourth guy is going to come from the second level. You know, one of the safeties might uh, be the fourth rusher. So it was a real mix and match type of game as far as what they did on third down with Trubisky, which is, uh, I mean, that, that's kind of standard practice in the NFL, frankly, with uh, with young quarterbacks, and, and Trubisky is still young, just, you know, the opening game of his third season. So it worked really well for the Packers. This defense uh, has a completely different look than it's had in the last couple of years, and, and really in the passing situations, the steady pressure on Trubisky, not letting him scramble around, not letting him have a whole lot of time in the pocket, was really the key to that defensive performance. Yeah, and, and this is the first time in a while you can remember that the Packers have a legitimate defense. You talked about some of the additions they've made. Adrian Amos makes it. It's fitting that he makes the game-winning interception as he obviously comes from Chicago. He's got to be pretty feeling pretty good about that. But I was very impressed with with what the Packers were able to do. Um, let's touch up on the injury report. You're at practice today. What's the update on guys like David Battiari and all that? Well, Bakhtiari did return to practice on Friday after sitting out Thursday with uh, the back injury. He was a limited participant on Friday. The Packers have officially listed him as questionable for the game. So, you know, at the time that practice finished up, you've got about, you know, 46, 47 hours or so before kickoff. So uh, Bakhtiari spoke to reporters in the locker room after practice and said, you know, he's going to get treatment on the back. Um, he said it was just something that flared up on him, I guess, at the beginning of the practice week. The Packers, having played on Thursday night last week, players had the weekend off, and then they were back uh, for a practice on Monday. And I guess that's where he kind of started having a little bit of an issue. So he was limited Wednesday. He sat out Thursday when they were full pads, did return on Friday as a limited participant. Now, Bakhtiari, it takes a lot to keep that guy out of a game, so um I would imagine he's going to do absolutely everything he can to be ready to go. And uh, as we all know, that that matchup that he's had over the years with uh, with Everson Griffin on the edge there is, has always been an entertaining one. So the other big name for the Packers in terms of the injury report was when uh, Jair Alexander at cornerback, he was added to the injury report on Thursday. 
but he was a full participant in practice on Friday, and they've actually removed him from the injury report now. So mm-hmm. no uh, um, no issues there in terms of uh, in terms of Alexander's availability. Other guys 